We learned previously that during the first half of the 20th century, individuals with disabilities were segregated from society, excluded from public education, placed in institutions for long-term custodial care, and were even considered unable to learn or benefit from educational programs. Disability had a negative connotation as individuals were not valued members of their communities and were often referred to as crippled, idiotic, feeble-minded, and insane. Despite many of the horrific events that occurred during this time frame, the Council for Exceptional Children was founded in 1922. Today, CEC is the largest and most influential professional organization for special educators. During the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, parents began to question whether placing their child with a disability in an institution for long-term custodial care was the only option, or even was it the best option for their child and family. Many decided to keep their children home and educate them in local settings. With the civil rights movement beginning in the 1950s, individuals with disabilities began seeing changes in laws and attitudes regarding discrimination. Back in 1954, the most famous civil rights case in our country, Brown versus the Board of Education, was decided. The Supreme Court of the United States said separate schooling was not equal because you were denying children who were separated, African American children, an equal opportunity to the property right of education. How do you think the Brown case influenced education for students with disabilities? For starters, many professionals start asking themselves whether separate classes provided students with disabilities with an appropriate education. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act was passed in 1965 as a part of the War on Poverty. ESEA emphasizes equal access to education and establishes high standards and accountability. The law authorizes federally funded education programs that are administered by the states. The ESEA, by and large, governs federal policy that addresses K-12 education and has been known as the general education law. Since 1965, the federal government's role in education has grown significantly and there have been many reauthorizations to the ESEA, some of which we will discuss later. Back to discussing the prominent court cases, the same logic that education was a property right was used in the Park lawsuit where it was argued that excluding children with disabilities from an education, and we're not talking about a separate education, we're talking about access to an education in this case. By denying them an education, the state was denying them a property right. The ruling was that if a state provided something publicly to one person, then the state had to provide it to all. On equal terms was the ruling. So in 1970, a major lawsuit was initiated called PARC or the Pennsylvania Association of Retarded Children versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That lawsuit was decided through what's called a consent agreement, and it was very important because it paved the way for free and appropriate education for children with disabilities. In this court case, it was a class action suit, which means that the case fought on behalf of a handful of children, but it was going to affect all of the children, specifically all of the children with disabilities in Pennsylvania. The plaintiffs, or the group re represented by Park, argued that students with mental retardation were not receiving publicly supported education and that the state was delaying or ignoring its constitutional obligation to provide publicly supported education. They defined four critical elements. First, that all children with cognitive impairments are capable of benefiting and have a right to an education. Secondly, the state could not deny students with disabilities access to a free public education. Third, education cannot be defined only as academic. And fourth, that the earlier the students were provided with education, the greater amount of learning could occur. Many of the components in the current federal law for special education today originated in the Park versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania lawsuit.
Park was the key right to access an education court case in the field of special education. Soon after the Park decision, Mills filed on behalf of all out-of-school students with disabilities, representing more than 18,000 students in the D.C. area excluded from public education. Brought by parents and guardians of seven children with various disabilities, such as mental retardation, epilepsy, and physical disabilities, were improperly excluded from school. The court held that because segregation on basis of race was unconstitutional, exclusion because of disability was also unconstitutional. The Diana versus Board of Education case addressed another terrible way in which schools historically discriminated against students from diverse backgrounds. A class action lawsuit was brought on behalf of nine Mexican American children in California, challenging the use of certain IQ tests that were used to place students in special education classes. This case stopped the practice of giving IQ tests in English to students whose primary language was Spanish, and that applies to any other foreign language for that matter. Obviously, if you give someone an intelligence test in a language that they do not understand, one will not get a valid measure of the child's intelligence, but rather the score will reflect a language difference. Diana was a critical right to non-discriminatory assessment court case. These cases set precedent for similar cases to be filed across the country. Within two and a half years, 46 right to education cases were filed on behalf of children with disabilities in 28 states, many with outcomes consistent with Park and the Mills decision. By early 1970s, the majority of states had passed laws requiring that students with disabilities receive public education. These laws varied and resulted in uneven attempts to provide education. During the same time, it became clear that some level of federal involvement was needed. The landmark law for special education was passed in 1975, and it was called Public Law 94-142 and at the time was the Education of the Handicapped Act, better known today as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. This law has been revised many times, and we will cover some of the more important revisions. This legislation contained core principles to ensure the educational rights of students with disabilities. These principles include zero reject, non-discriminatory evaluation, free, appropriate public education, least restrictive environment, procedural due process, and parental participation. Zero reject. No matter how severe a child's disability is, schools cannot deny a child an education. Non-discriminatory evaluation means that the schools need to make special efforts to ensure that their assessment procedures are not biased against any particular racial, or cultural or linguistic group. Any test administered needs to be in the child's native language. This means they must use culturally fair assessments and have procedures in place that assure fairness. This is particularly true in regard to diagnoses of disability conditions. You want to make sure that diagnoses of a disability is made on the basis of disability characteristics, not on cultural differences. Free and Appropriate Public Education, or FAPE. Education has to be free. It can be of no cost to the parents, and it has to be appropriate. That means a school cannot just do anything they decide and call it a school program. It has to be a meaningful education for the child. Schools cannot turn away anyone. All means all in this case. And they have to provide anyone who comes through the school doors with an appropriate education. Additionally, every child who's determined to be eligible for special education needs to have an IEP that addresses the child's learning needs. IEP stands for the Individualized Education Plan. LRE, or Least Restrictive Environment. Students must be educated in a least restrictive environment. That means the environment where they can get a quality education that's most similar to the environment or setting 
where other same age students without disabilities attend. If the student can receive a quality education in the regular education classroom, then the least restrictive environment the student would be placed in is the general education environment. Procedural due process are provisions that are in place so families don't have to accept what the school district decides would be an appropriate education or appropriate educational services. Each state has a due process procedure in place that allows families of children with IEPs to appeal decisions made by the school district and the state boards of education provide an independent due process hearing officer to serve as the judge. The due process hearing officer is considered to be a neutral judge that can decide on behalf of the school or the parents. So when schools and parents can't agree on the course of action to take and are at a standstill, then parents can initiate a due process hearing and take their case to this neutral judge. When there is a due process case, the due process officer, officer hears the parent's side and also hears the school's side and then makes a decision that is binding. Lastly, the parental participation provision requires that schools work collaboratively with parents in developing IEPs and special education services. Actually, the parents have quite a bit of a decision-making power according to the federal law and are considered a very integral part of the student's team. The Rowley case was the Supreme Court's first opportunity to interpret FAPE. Amy Rowley was a student who was deaf. She had very minimal residual hearing and was an excellent lip reader. There was a trial period in kindergarten where she received an interpreter, but she did not use the services. Amy continued to first grade and an IEP meeting was held where her parents wanted an interpreter in all of the classes, but because Amy did well enough without the interpreter in kindergarten, the school did not want to provide one and said no. The school felt that they were providing her an appropriate education without providing the interpreter. The court ruled in favor of the school district, with the key legal principle being that a school must provide an appropriate education, but, not, but did not have the obligation to provide an optimal education to children with disabilities. Students with disabilities do not have an enforceable right to the best education available or to an education that allows them to achieve their maximum potential. Rather, they are entitled to an education that is appropriate. Over the years, there have been many amendments to Public Law 94-142, or the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. A few of the important changes include, in 1986, amendments extended the law to young children. Prior to 1986, the law only applied to children who were 6 to 21 years of age. The 1986 amendments set up early childhood education programs to cover children between 3 and 5 years old, and the states were mandated to provide these services. Additionally, provisions recommended that the state also set up infant to toddler programs to cover children who are birth to two years old, but this actually was voluntary on the part of each of the states, but every state does have a zero to two program. The changes to the law in 1990 were important because autism was added as its own disability category, as well as defined traumatic brain injury for school services. It was also decided then that ADHD was not going to be a disability category, as it's not. We also decided that transition services were critical and the law required that schools start planning for older students to transition. It was noticed that students with disabilities were not being as successful as their non-disabled peers, so schools really needed to include a transition plan for students. Federal legislation requires transition planning must start by age 16. However, in Illinois, the age when we need to actually begin a transition plan is 14 and a half. The 1997 amendments were important because they took back zero reject just a little bit. If a child brings drugs to school or a weapon to school, the child can be expelled even if the child has a disability and an IEP. It also covers students with disabilities being included in state assessments. There are two other laws affecting special education that are important to learn about. The Americans with Disability Act of 1990, or ADA, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, 
are civil right laws, not special education law. They have resulted in increasing numbers of accommodation plans in our schools. Without going into details about these two laws, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act is always the one that is applied to schools because schools receive federal money. So from this point on, we will refer to Section 504 and 504 plans, but realize the same legal principles apply because of the ADA or Americans with Disability Act. It's important to know that students may have a disability, but they will not necessarily meet the eligibility criteria for special education services. As you recall, there are 13 disability categories within IDEA, and each category has specific disability criteria and definitions. In Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, disability is defined in a broader way because Section 504 of the Rehab Act is, has a much broader definition of disability, more children are covered under Section 504 than are covered under IDEA. So children who do not qualify under IDEA, which really means that their disability does not impact their educational performance, can qualify for protection or accommodations under Section 504 of the Rehab Act. If a child meets the definition of disability through the Rehabilitation Act, through Section 504, the school is obligated to provide that child with reasonable accommodations for their disability and equal access to educational opportunity. Section 504 is not as specific as a law as IDEA. Section 504 plans get their name from Section 504 of the Rehab Act, and they focus on how a disability will be accommodated in the classroom. It's not an individualized education plan. There are not goals or objectives. It's not nearly as involved as an IEP. But it is a plan that assures accommodations to help the student be successful. A 504 plan that requires a school to make accommodations is a far less intense obligation on the part of the school than an IEP. Nobody would have both an IEP and a Section 504 plan because there is a section within the IEP that also includes accommodations the student may need and would include everything that would be in a 504 plan. For instance, if a student needed extra time taking a test in order to show what they know because of a disability condition, then that would be in a Section 504 plan that the student be allowed extra or extended time when taking a test. Another example of a student served through Section 504 might be one who has type 1 di diabetes. Through Section 504, the school district would ensure that the school professionals working with the student understands his needs, that the student has immediate access to snacks and water, and that the student is allowed to use the bathroom whenever requested. The student does not need an educational services that would be included in an IEP. To clarify, let me ask you a question to make sure you have this straight. Can a child not be eligible for an IEP, but be eligible for a Section 504 plan? The answer is yes. Just a few more court cases that have had influence on how and where services are provided to students with disabilities. The Daniel and Oberti cases are interesting because both dealt with the issue of least restrictive environment. In both court cases, the parents wanted their child more fully included in the general education classroom. The upshot was that the court said it was legal to educate a child outside of the general education classroom, but that a school district should do the best it can to educate a child in a general education classroom. That is, separate education in an environment outside of the general education setting should be a last resort. A school needs to show that the child will learn more in the separate setting in order to justify education outside of the general education classroom and must first offer supplemental aids and services to support the child in the general education classroom. The final case is the Cedar Rapids versus Garrett F case. Garrett was a boy with significant health issues and required the school to hire a nurse for practically one-on-one -on -one assistance the entire time he was at school. The school said it was too expensive and wanted to put the child on homebound instruction where teachers and related service providers would come into the student's house to provide instruction. The court upheld the principle of zero reject, 
the severity of a child's disability cannot be a reason to deny a child an education. Nursing services were considered to be a related service and the school needed to provide that. Also, the court said that extraordinary costs could not be a factor. Just because a child costs a lot to educate is not a valid reason to deny a child FAPE, which at this point you know does mean free and appropriate education. Regardless of the disability, you cannot reject a student. In 2002, Congress amended the Elementary and Secondary Education Act from 1965 and reauthorized it as the No Child Left Behind Act. Remember, ESEA is the nation's general education law and is currently known as No Child Left Behind or NCLB. Given the importance of ESEA in the lives of children with and without disabilities, it is important that you become familiar and understand some of the important provisions of NCLB. These include Title I, which are meant to support programs in schools and school districts to improve the learning of children from low-income families. The U.S. Department of Education provides Title I funds to states to give to school districts based on the number of children from low-income families within each district. State assessments. This refers to the tests that are developed by each state that students will take every year in grades three through eight and at least once in high school. Using these tests, the state will be able to compare schools to one another to know which ones need extra help to improve. Adequate yearly progress, or AYP. This is the term No Child Left Behind uses to explain that the child's school has met state reading and math goals. School in need of improvement refers to schools receiving Title I funds that have not met state reading and math goals, or AYP, for at least two years. If a school is labeled as a school in need of improvement, it receives extra support to improve and the students must be given the option to transfer to another public school. Also, children may be eligible to receive free tutoring and extra help with schoolwork. Supplemental Educational Services refers to the tutoring and extra help with schoolwork in subjects such as reading and math that children from low-income families may be eligible to receive. This help is provided free of charge and generally takes place outside of the regular school day, such as after school or during the summer. Highly qualified teachers. A teacher who proves that he or she knows the subjects he or she is teaching, has a college degree, and is state certified. No Child Left Behind requires that students be taught by a highly qualified teacher in core academic areas. I also strongly believe that uh, we, we want to make sure the No Child Left Behind Act continues to work. It's a, you, you measure every day. That's why you're successful business people. I mean, you know what your business is doing. I believe we ought to extend that same principle to our public schools and ask a simple question. Can a child read at grade level? And in order to determine that, that's, that's why you measure. And if the answer is yes, we all say great. If the answer is no, the answer question will be, then what are you going to do about it? And so the principle behind the No Child Left Behind Act is to set high standards, believe every child can learn, and measure to see if we're getting results. And Congress need not weaken such a good piece of legislation. Congress, prior to the 2004 reauthorization, was afraid educators had low expectations concerning students with disabilities and that educators were not focusing on what worked or not using research-based techniques to teach students with disabilities. The reauthorization of IDEA focused on increasing the academic achievement of students in special education, writing measurable goals and actually measuring them, and on progress monitoring. IDEA 2004 focused on high expectations and access to the general education curriculum and environment, strengthened the role of the parental involvement, coordinated with other educational reform acts, such as NCLB, and made sure that IDEA and NCLB interconnected well, and they do, as we'll see on the upcoming slide, provided students with what's appropriate, and we've already talked about that. We need to make sure that the professionals working with our children are highly qualified. 
Many of you have heard of that term because it is a really important indicator of No Child Left Behind, and we need to make sure that we are integrating and using evidence-based practices. Another outcome of IDEA 2004 is that the paperwork required for special education will be streamlined and reduced. Don't get me wrong, paperwork is important and shows a trail and documents what is necessary. And finally, with the growth of technology, how can we use technology as a support? Here are the major principles of both No Child Left Behind and IDEA 2004 and what you see are similar components and overlapping principles. You'll notice that over time, there have been many changes to special education laws and regulations. Towards the beginning of the 20th century, many efforts needed to focus on providing access to education for all learners. Around the turn of the century, we really began focusing on the quality of instruction our students receive. The history of special education documents periods of deplorable practices that really do help explain why today's laws must exist to protect students with disabilities. Before ending, let's take a few moments to review a short clip on the history of IDEA. Before 1975, access to an appropriate education was denied for most students with disabilities. Hundreds of thousands of individuals with severe disabilities were housed in state institutions, and schools only educated approximately one-fifth of students with disabilities. In addition, many states had laws that actually prohibited education in regular schools for students with intellectual disabilities, emotional disturbance, or students who were deaf, blind, or both. Children with disabilities in this time seldom became students. They were characteristically not welcome to the schools. They were, in fact, affirmatively excluded from the schools. Under laws that required that, that were adopted in the early 20th century by every state legislature in the Union. Those laws followed shortly after statutes in every state creating isolated, distant, segregated institutions, public institutions, to house the disabled, as the statutes frequently said, for life. In 1975, Congress enacted the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, Public Law 94-142. This act articulated a compelling national mission to provide a free, appropriate public education for all children with disabilities in the least restrictive environment. Well, it brought to children and then adults with disabilities all of the glories of a decent equal citizenship. It turned out that people with disabilities, including significant intellectual disabilities, have like all human beings, enormous capabilities. With those capabilities supported and freed by the schools, their lives have become thoroughly different. By the late 70s, you could see smiles on the faces of family members of children with disabilities. And you could see in schoolyards all over the country, children playing together. Uh, people with disability were no longer isolated and hidden. They were among us and with us and participating and contributing. Many now thought to be uneducable uh, 30, 40 years ago, now attending college and doing very well, thank you. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act supported states and localities in protecting the rights and meeting the individual needs of students with disabilities. It indicated specific federal mandates to improve how children with disabilities were identified and educated, to evaluate the success of these efforts, and to provide due process protections for children and families. In 1986, amendments to the Education of All Handicapped Children Act authorized programs for early intervention with infants and toddlers with disabilities. In the 1990s, the law was reauthorized as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, reaffirming the requirements for free, appropriate public education 
and strengthening the law's commitment to greater inclusion in community schools, furthering the movement of students with disabilities towards being educated in general education settings. The 1990 amendments also provided for federally sponsored research and supports, which included initiatives for transition services from high school to post-secondary education and adult living for students with disabilities. Without a doubt, the transition services provision in IDEA is one of its most important components. This provision requires all who are working with students with disabilities to take the long view in the planning process with an eye clearly focused on quality of life outcomes. In 1997, amendments to IDEA continued to focus on access. The definition of access, however, was broadened to encompass not just physical access to schools, but also access to the general education curriculum, leading to higher academic expectations and greater outcomes for students with disabilities. The focus must be on instruction that uses individualized approaches for accessing the general education curriculum. Schools support learning and high achievement for all with increasing opportunities for students with disabilities to be educated to the maximum extent possible alongside their non-disabled classmates. In 2004, amendments to IDEA increased state and local accountability for educating students with disabilities. There is no pressure on schools to work hard on behalf of students who are excluded from the accountability system. For this reason, it is important that all students, including all students with disabilities, participate in the state accountability system. And for this reason, IDEA now mandates that students with disabilities be included in all state accountability programs. In addition, the 2004 amendments included provisions to ensure that special education personnel are highly qualified to reduce disproportionate representation of minorities in special education, and to expand methods for identifying students with specific learning disabilities and school procedures for disciplining students with disabilities. Instructional programming and the amount of supports provided are driven by student needs. In the last 35 years, IDEA has led to improved access, accountability, and achievement for students with disabilities. As of 2008, 95% of students with disabilities were being educated in local neighborhood schools and almost 6 million students with disabilities were educated in general education classrooms for at least part of the day. Achievement due to IDEA extends beyond K-12 education. For infants and toddlers, the number of children birth to age 5 receiving services under Part C and B of IDEA increased dramatically and families became part of the planning and education process. Graduation rates for students with disabilities receiving a regular diploma have increased 43% since 1995-96, and since that time, there has been a 24 percentage point decrease in high school dropout rates. Enrollment rates at both two- and four-year colleges have almost doubled for students with disabilities since 1993, and more students with disabilities hold jobs after leaving high school than ever before. One of the most striking facts is that over the past 20 years, there has been marked increases in employment, post-secondary education, and community living measures across all disability groups. Likewise, significant headway is being made in improving academic accomplishments and successes in an environment of heightened standards and expectations. It's an American idea. Today's child will be tomorrow's citizen. Education shapes our expression of liberty. And separate? Well, that has never been equal. We are the students of a new day. Brave scholars who claim desk and classroom, book and school, until the self-evident truth expressed through our victories gave this nation's first declaration renewed life. Each mind is beautiful. Strength has many forms. And we are all able.
just a few more quirks.